since we had some people out last week, I'll do a quick recap. We'll pray. I'm going to say up front, if there, if there was a lesson that I suspected we might have to continue next week, it's this one. There's a lot of content, and a lot of it shouldn't be glossed over. Um, even right up front, there's going to be a lot that we need to dig into in the first couple chapters. So we might have to continue this next week. Next week will be a good week for it. There's some odd stuff that we can gloss a little more next week. Uh, But last week, we basically looked at David's shining moments as king, his absolute best, best scenarios. The first thing he did was he brought the Ark of the Covenant back. uh, He brought it to Jerusalem, where they had set up the tabernacle for it. And in doing so, he modeled a royal priesthood. We went way into depth on that. He's a king who was dressed as a priest. There were sacrifices involved. And we'll talk about that in our last lesson when we look at how all of this stuff points ahead to Christ. So he brought the ark to Jerusalem. God made his covenant with the line of David. And we'll talk about that as well. We looked at some military victories and he had compassion for a friend, the son of Jonathan, and an enemy, and that didn't go as well. But we saw the highlights of David, and we're going to open up in prayer and then look at some of the less than optimal things from David. So let's pray. Holy Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for everyone being able to make it out, and I just pray that you'd be with us during this time of study, that you would open our hearts and minds to the scriptures, help us to understand things, and just learn things we didn't before that draw us closer to you. Pray to be with us during this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, if you don't know, we are on page 81 in our textbook, and we're going to start in chapter 11, but opening question. I literally, I just wrote ooh, like you, next to this in my book. I didn't know this, and I don't like that I know this. Apparently, under getting started, worms emerge from apples because they start as eggs in apple blossoms. The apple's corruption grows from the inside. Did anyone know this? Like, did you know this is how that worked? Did that make that, that made sense? Like, I guess I always figured it like ate its way in there. Yeah, I never gave a thought, though. But so, unfortunately, now we all know this. And question one, they're asking for the metaphor of this. How does this fact illustrate the development of corrupting behavior in a person's life? They're going in deep with this. I like it. I like it. Starts out small, grows over time. Any other thoughts? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Starts from the inside, grows over time. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, and then question two. I think we understand this, but why does God's word play an important role in warding off immorality? Okay. It gives us guidelines, um, facts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we get the idea of this. And unfortunately, this is going to relate to more of King David's reign and be a contrast to what we saw last week. So why don't we just start in 
2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab, his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. The woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Opening thoughts. What are your thoughts? What jumps out at you especially right off the bat? Uh, from when? Oh, sure. Seems to be. Yeah. Yeah, the book claims that he is now 50. I was unable to figure out exactly how they calculated that, but that sounds right, which is not usually what I like to go on, but that sounds right. See, so yeah, there's probably some time. Anything else? Like, what, what jumps out at you? Yes. Yeah, that is not available to most people to just hey, go get her, get that woman. Do we know who Uriah the Hittite is? That this woman is his wife. Yeah. Yeah, so we haven't discussed this yet. And I, I don't think we actually find out until the end of 2 Samuel that David has this band of people who are called his mighty men. It's typically, I think the list is, has 30, 30 men on it. And at the end of, we'll actually look at it next week, it kind of reads like, it's like a capsule form of every action movie you want to see from that time period. Like they say, they do like little exploits, like, oh, this guy, this guy fought a lion inside of a cave. And you're like, tell me more. But the Bible's like, no. And then it just moves on to the next guy. And this guy killed, you know, held off 300 men doing this. So they list all of his, his elite guard. Uriah the Hittite is one of them, which is probably why the house is so close to his palace. The elite group probably lived very close, even though now they're all off at war. Also notice he is not off at war. The Bible makes a point that, so they say when the year was expired, based on how their seasons work and how they think about the new year. Uh, it's spring, so they, they typically have the start of the new year. They understand that to be spring when everything comes back to life and you can actually go outside and do things, and that's, that's when kings go off to war. So the Bible makes it explicit that at the time when kings go off to war, Joab's, uh, kit, David sent Joab, his general. It even says again, like, they were doing all that cool stuff. They were, they were doing their war, but David was at Jerusalem. So he, he's not where he should be. He's not, for the first time, he's not performing his kingly duties. Like, we made such a big deal of the idea that even when he wasn't yet king and he's running from Saul, he's still being more of a king to the people than Saul ever was. And now we have this situation where for the first time, he's kind of not doing the things he should be doing as king. And then you have this sinful situation. Now, given what we just discussed, I want to read from the book and tell me what you think about this, because I, I have a differing opinion. On page 82 in your book, uh, we're going to read the paragraph that starts with, The affair was not entirely David's fault but he was without excuse. One night he observed Bathsheba as she took a bath on her rooftop. He didn't have to stare at Bathsheba, nor did he have to summon her to his palace. Bathsheba, too, was at fault. She enticed David by her indiscreet bathing. Further, she could have resisted the king's summons by reminding the messengers that she was a married woman. 
Instead, she willingly submitted to David's advances. Soon, both she and David tasted the bitter fruit of their affair. What do you think of the book's interpretation of that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any agreements, disagreements, additions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so so she, she is on the roof as well, or a roof, her own roof. So, yeah, if you can imagine, like, the ancient Near Eastern kind of um, bricks, brick-ish structures with these flat roofs, a lot of times it was used for, like, a place to hang out, like, just... Uh, you know, like this time of day comes around, you just, you go up to the roof, you, you do that, you eat, you do whatever. Um, clearly they had some sort of bathing station, but I, 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 don't, I don't know what's, what's a non-awkward way to put that. Um, it wouldn't be a bathroom up on the roof, but um, it was not in the house. But yeah, no, that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Do you have any insight on that? Mm-hmm. As yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what do you think about the bath on the roof? And it's probably a little anachronistic of us to think of like a deep claw-footed bathtub, you know. Oh, okay. You think that would be kind of... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it seems like it could have been a completely innocuous situation, like, like if someone accidentally walks in on, like, into a room without thinking. Um, but, yeah, it, it... So the author does something really clever if you notice when, let's see. Okay, so I guess in verse two. So it came to pass in the evening tide, David rose from off his bed and walked upon the roof. Um, okay, so he, he saw the woman, and then, uh, let's see. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so he saw the woman, Uh, At the end of verse 2, the woman is very beautiful to look upon. And then verse 4, he sent the messenger and took her. So in Adam and Eve in the garden, it's the same set of ideas. It, It actually gets repeated throughout the Old Testament to show you that, like, you're at a tree decision. Are you going to take from the tree of life or the tree of good and evil? Eve sees the fruit, it's good to look upon, and then she takes it. And then this, this idea keeps getting applied throughout the Old Testament to show you like, oh, they're at the decision point. Are they going to follow God or do what they want to do? And most of the time, they end up taking whatever the thing is. So I think it is setting us up to look like David is definitely the one at fault 
I don't particularly see any way that Bathsheba could be, you know, re, you know, buff the king's messengers. That doesn't seem like a thing that's going to happen. No. Yeah. Okay. So we all are more or less on the same page about that. Let's look at page, still on page 82. After some time, Bathsheba announced her pregnancy, and David had two choices, to confess his sin or cover it up. Sadly, David chose to cover his sin. David's first reaction to the news of Bathsheba's pregnancy was to call her husband home from battle uh, from the battle at Rabbah, about 45 miles northeast of Jerusalem. The plan was to make it appear Uriah was the baby's father. Uriah, however, didn't go home as expected. When questioned, he replied it was his soldierly duty to be on the battlefield and not in bed with his wife. David's next desperate move was to try to make Uriah drunk. This scheme didn't work either. So David calls the husband, that woman's husband, home from battle, basically asks, you know, hey, how's the battle going? Get some kingly data and says, okay, great. You can go back tomorrow. Uh, just go, go be with your wife, you know, go home, go. And he expects, okay, they're, they're going to do that. It's going to assume, okay, that's, that's the father. Uriah has too much honor and integrity to even go home. He just, uh, hey, all my troops are out on the battlefield. I'm not, I'm not going to sleep in my bed. Like, so, what ends up happening, we'll, we'll look at what ends up happening in chapter 11, verse 14. Came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab, to his general, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and some, some fell of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So right off the bat, we have adultery on the part of David and murder. Sent by, a, the, the dark irony is that he had Uriah take this letter back to his commander that was pronouncing his, his death. So David is not, David's having some, he's having some problems here. Let's carry on in verse, uh, chapter 12. I'm going to read a long section. It's from Nathan, who is the court prophet. Verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and said unto him, Okay, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man, he had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him, and with his children it did eat his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom and was as a daughter. Uh, and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he didn't want to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, that man has done this thing, shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I, I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if, it ha if that had not been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, 
and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sun, sight of the sun. For thou did secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion unto the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Kind of a long section there. What are your thoughts right off the bat with this, though? What jumps out at you? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a good parable, right? Yeah. Pulls the old switcheroo. That's a technical theological term. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what do you think about God's response? Is this, is this harsh? Is this as expected? What, what do you think about that? Okay. But the way it reads, it looks like David instantly, uh, you know, went right to the Lord. Mm-hmm. He, he, he was caught technically, but he didn't like lie his way out of it or mm-hmm. kill Nathan or do any of those things. Like, you know what I mean? Because like, that's happened before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So even though he definitely did wrong here several times, yeah. uh, it looks, according to the list, it reads this way. It looks like he immediately, you know, asked, you know I guess he asked for forgiveness, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So maybe if he hadn't done all that, maybe the Lord would have been even more. Sure. Practical. Yeah. Okay. Was it just justice and mercy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you're right. Yeah, so we're going to see a lot of that tonight, depending on if we get to it, to the first point, he does, in this text, he, it was a quick, I've sinned against the Lord, he, he, said, he confesses that to Nathan. If you want to read something in your extra time, uh, Psalm 51, that is a Psalm of David, and I, it should say right on it that it's a psalm of repentance after the sin with Bathsheba. So that's, that's his long, poetic, spirit-inspired feelings slash thoughts and his understanding in light of his sin and the Lord's mercy and judgment. And that's just a good, good psalm for that. It's not a fun psalm. It's not one of the lighter psalms. It, it's tough, but you really see into David's heart there. Also, with his punishments, notice it's not, he's not the only one paying for his sin. And this comes up a lot. So, in a way, you can think, well, okay, so he's, God said he's, this this child that him and Bathsheba have, or will have, that child will not live. So, in a way, it's, you know, it's David's child, but in a way, that's someone else's life who is... That, that child had nothing to do with it. You know, it wasn't his fault. He's paying for the sins of his father in this case. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. Yeah. 
No, that, that's that's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You reap what you sow, and you reap what other people sow. Sometimes. So, and this is going to spell, as Pastor said, this is going to spell disaster for his immediate family for decades to come. So there's a lot involved with this. And on page on page 83, question 8. So it says, uh, what six consequences would accompany David's sin? But I'll just read you the six from the book. The six consequences that would accompany this sin are his sons would die a violent death. He would be driven from his throne. His wives would be raped, if you caught that. Everyone would know of his secret sin, the illegitimate baby would die, and David's testimony would be blasphemed. So, literally all this will take place tonight if we get to it. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of wide-ranging consequence for his sin here. Okay, let's look at... All right, we're going to look at more in chapter 12. And I want to say, this isn't something that moves the story along, particularly. It's not a big action scene. It's not a big political thing. But I think we need to look at this for, A, the heart of David, but also some good theological truth that comes out in this that informs certain things we believe. So uh, start in verse 15. This is right after the conversation. And Nathan departed unto his house, And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The elders of his house arose and went to him and raised him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive... We spoke unto him, and he would not listen to our voice. How then will he vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, and washed himself, and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went. Uh, then he came into his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said the servants unto him, What is this thing that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he's dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. That's a, that's a tough passage. However, we see a lot of important ideas from that. One, we see that no matter what God said to him through Nathan, he's still always counting on the idea that God could still be merciful to him. Like that His view of God, even as this tough man of war, he's he's the authoritative king, he is still always in this place where God's mercy seems to be the thing that he always points to, always relies on, always thinks about. Also, so we have the belief that in our church and churches like ours, it's a common belief that, okay, what happens to children that die especially you know this this is this child was a week old died on the seventh day so david had the belief that the end of verse 23 i shall go to him but he shall not return to me the idea that he still believes he will see this child again 
And we don't have to get into all the ramifications of that, but in, I know in our church, we tend to believe that if children who die who never had an opportunity to, you know, make decisions to follow Christ for anything like that, this is one of the many things that we go to that says, okay, David fully believed that he would see his child again. There, so it's an important theological concept, and I think a very important insight into the heart of David as he relies on God's mercy. So that could be dug into more, but there's a lot of, lot of good, deep stuff there. Okay. And verse 24. David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Not a whole lot of action in that, but Solomon is the last big figure we're going to talk about for this study. We see his birth. I didn't learn until this week. Last week we talked about David was not allowed to build the temple, and one of the reasons that's given in Chronicles is that David is a man of war, but his son will be a man of peace, and that this man of peace will build the temple to God. So the name Solomon actually means man of peace, so he was really easily broadcasting, like, if you had any doubt, who's supposed to build the temple? It was pretty clear right from the start that Solomon was this next chosen ruler, the man of peace, and the Lord loves him right from the start. He, he's blessed early on. Okay, in your book on page 85. So we saw David's sin, and for the rest of the time, we're going to see the unfolding consequences. All right, page 85. Paragraph starts with Amnon. Amnon, David's firstborn son, and child of Ahinoam, one of David's first wives, became infatuated with his half-sister Tamar, David's daughter by Makkah. Uh, his cousin, Jonadab, a subtle or cunning person, suggested a plan whereby Amnon could fulfill his sexual passions. He advised Amnon to feign illness and request that Tamar attend him and feed him. At David's request, she attended to her sick brother, or sick brother, who overpowered her in, in his bedroom and raped her. David was outraged when he learned of Amnon's violation of Tamar. So, verse 14, what should David have done to Amnon? How should this have been handled? I see someone's looking up Leviticus. Why don't you read that since, you have, since you're pulling it up? Yep. Okay, so they point to a verse in Leviticus that basically says uh, sibling relations should result in being cut off from the people, which is typically understood being exiled. Now, oddly enough, what they don't include in that question, or like the verses that they're mentioning, they don't include Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27. That is where the the law actually handles rape accusations, or in fact. That, is, that carries the death penalty in ancient Israel. So, uh, just for the brother, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird situation all around, because not only do you have that, you have it being a half-sister, so something definitely should have happened, something very big. Now, we'll keep going in your book. It, they they summarize it well. When Tamar's brother Absalom heard of this incestuous crime, he said nothing to Amnon, but he secretly began plotting revenge. Two years later, Absalom invited his sheep shearers, David, 
and all his sons to party at Baal Hazor, 10 miles north of Jerusalem. David excused himself, but after some coaxing from Absalom, David's sons, including Amnon, arrived in Ephraim country. By previous arrangement, Absalom had commanded his men to slay Amnon when he was drunk with wine. When the murder occurred, all the sons fled for their lives. David received word that all his sons were killed, but Jonadab called the report false. Absalom had murdered only Amnon as revenge for raping Tamar. As David's oldest living son, Absalom became the natural heir to the throne. Meanwhile, he, th he fled the area while David and his sons mourned the death of Amnon. How do you feel about this situation, especially the dinner party? Yeah. What do you, what do you imply by that? Well, taking the whole blood. Hmm. Okay. And I'm not saying that really starting to understand. I'm just saying Yeah. <clears throat> what do we think of David during this? Yeah. Mhm. Mm Yeah, he probably wouldn't have gone to eat at his brother's house two days after, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He told him that sons would die, yeah. Oh, I don't... There's no indication in the, and we didn't read the text. There's no indication I, he had kingly things to do. But yeah, the interesting thing is that two years goes by, and apparently David has done nothing. the The Bible does say that he was, like the text did, that he was he, he was very angry that this happened, but he didn't do anything about it. So once again, he is sort of no, it, he is not doing the things that the king should be doing. Like, even in his own family, meeting out justice is what the king should be doing. Did they say that the daughter ordered money because that's what happened? Did David know? And she used her half-brother's illness? Oh, well, yeah, because David was angry about it, and, like, they, they knew what happened. Yeah. I think he was angry that he happened. He didn't know who did it. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's the thing. Because of the situation... You know, the brother pretended to be... Yeah, so what, what didn't get said in the synopsis was this brother pretended to be sick and asked David, hey, can you have the sister come and, you know, tend to me, basically? So there, there was no getting away with that. Um, Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any chance that even though he was the king, the law, you name it, any chance he thought, well, you know, I did the same thing, and nobody took it? I mean, not, not incest, but yeah. that's you. That, that would be a generous spin, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Doesn't, doesn't mention anything. Yeah, it's, it, it's hard to feel 
super angry at Absalom, the, the older brother. Murder is wrong, but sometimes you get it. Like, sometimes it makes sense. How, so now, now Absalom is the oldest living son, technically in line for the throne, if things hadn't already been promised to Solomon. Yeah, 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 because the problematic son was older. He's now dead. And because of this, it says Absalom flees the country, which is looking an awful lot like past to David, but in different ways. Okay, so Absalom flees, and he's gone for three years in surrounding countries. We have another story where a woman, it reminds me of the situation with Nathan the prophet. Joab, David's key general, he wants Absalom to come back as the oldest son. He, he thinks he should be permitted to come back into the country. So he has a woman basically go to the king with a problem that, like Nathan's situation, mirrors the current situation that David is in with his son. Like this estranged situation where David makes the judgment basically like, oh, this person should be forgiven. And she goes, oh, yeah, that's, that sounds an awful lot like Absalom. You know, uh, it's kind of a... Again, that old switcheroo, that, uh, the, the parable there. So he permits Absalom to come back to the country, but they still remain estranged for two years. So you have another five years that pass. And we're going to look at chapter 15. I labeled this the plot. All right, so... David and Absalom finally, after those five years, reunite in some fashion. 15 verse 1, And it came to pass after this, after they reunited, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man had a controversy that came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called to him and said, oh, Where are you from? What city art thou? He said, and he said, thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. Absalom said unto him, see, thy matters are good and right, and there's no man uh, deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, moreover, if only I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath a suit or a case might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Okay, so what's happening? Okay, I'll just read it from the book. In, on page 86, we have, After four years, Absalom used... Nope, I'm sorry. That's not that. I will briefly explain the plot. So, basically, now that Absalom's back in the kingdom, he sets up by the gates of Jerusalem, where the wise, that's where, like, the wise men gather, that's where business is done in the gates. And whenever someone comes who needs to bring a case before the king, he stops and, hey, man, where, where are you from? Oh, what's going on? Oh, you have this problem? It's a shame. You know what? King's busy. He can't see you. It's a shame there's no one who's deputized to solve your problems. But, you know, I could probably help you out. And he, he does this for years and starts gaining the trust of the people. The common people, they kind of know, well, if you have a problem, you know, that the king, he's doing king stuff. If you have a problem, you go to his oldest son, Absalom. And he starts gaining a reputation and sort of winning the populace to himself. And now we'll look at page 86. After four years, Absalom used religion as a cloak for his deceitful purposes. He received permission from David to go to Hebron to fulfill a fictitious vow. Instead, he sent messengers throughout the land, saying he should be proclaimed king of Israel. Unaware of what was happening, 200 men, including Ahithophel, David's close advisor, were invited to join the conspiracy. 
large numbers of people were attracted to Absalom. So it's starting to take form. And do we remember anything about Hebron, that location? Remember hearing about that? Do you remember what it was? No? Okay. Hebron was the location in Judah where David, when David was just king over Judah before he was king over the whole country, that's where he reigned from. So you're kind of going back to like that opposing throne, if we can put it that way. And everyone liked Absalom. He was taking care of the people. Apparently he's another tall, good-looking guy. He's, no, he's got very long hair. Keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. Let's look at... No, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in the book for a minute. Okay, so we saw that large numbers were attracted to Absalom. He's going to Hebron. Fearful for their lives, David and thousands of others fled Jerusalem. At the summit of the Mount of Olives, David met his friend Hushai, whom he urged to return and serve Absalom and thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. Um, skip that next paragraph. In route to the Jordan River, one of Saul's servants, Shimei, uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Shimei pelted David with stones and dirt while cursing him as a bloodthirsty man. Apparently, Shimei blamed David for Saul's death. Abishai wanted to kill Shimei on the spot, but David prevented him. David humbly accepted the abuse and graciously let Shimei continue with his ranting, believing that God would settle the matter in the end. Okay, so David finds himself fleeing from Jerusalem as Absalom is proclaimed king by the people and all these messengers down in Hebron. I know I didn't give you a ton of information. We didn't look at the text on this one. First thoughts, what do you think of David's actions here? Yeah. Let, let's start with the running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, it's walled. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You would think. Yeah. Yeah, it's another situation where you're kind of like... That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. No, that's a good point. Yeah, we think of a standing army, yeah. Right, right, that's a good point. Yeah. No time to muster the troops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, it comes across as a weak move. Like, it, David doesn't look good here, even though Absalom is plotting against him. Like, he, Absalom is in the wrong. He is trying to usurp the throne from his father. I don't think David comes out looking good in this scenario. One, there's, and again, we didn't read the text of it. It's very long. We didn't, we don't see him looking to God for this, like, is his usual way to go. And it's interesting that it seems whenever, whenever he doesn't explicitly ask God what to do, it's usually questionable. You know, like we had this when he was running from Saul. Like, should he have been trusting God to protect him, or should he be running and hanging out with the Philistines? When he doesn't ask God what to do, it's, 
it's just, it's fuzzy. It, get, it tends to get gray very quickly, and you don't really know how to take his actions a lot of times. But David finds himself once again on the run, this time from his own son. And the... Yeah, did you have something about... No, I'm, I'm pointing at you. Um, you asked if I was talking about David fleeing or the man throwing stones. Yeah. Did you have something on him? Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you have this odd scenario where as they're leaving Jerusalem, they're they're crossing around the Jordan. There's this guy who he knows was a used to be a servant of King Saul. And the guy is like throwing rocks at him, yelling curses, obscenities. And it's it's a pretty funny interaction because the the one general with him is just like Give me a minute. I'm going to go get his head. Just, I'll, I'll be right back. Like, it's just a very casual, l- let me go kill him for you. And he says, no. And he's, the guy's accusing David of, like, you caused the death of Saul. He, he accuses him of being a bloodthirsty man. And based on David's, what we already read and David's reaction to it, he says, like, no, let, let him be. Maybe, he even says, maybe, like, God put this in his heart to curse me. One, I don't think he's feeling too great about his situation, having to flee Jerusalem. But also, we read that one of the consequences for his sin earlier on was that his testimony, like his life, it's a, it was kind of like going to be blasphemed, which is not how we normally talk about humans. But basically, the good that he did will be evil spoken of. So... He went out of his way to not touch Saul, but the accusations come, and it's kind of like a a tarnished reputation seemed to be part of God's judgment on him, that even though he, he tried to do good, you're having this situation, and the fact that he just, he lets it go, he lets it happen, kind of tells you how he's interpreting what's going on here, so... It's subtle, it's a weird little scene, but it it says a lot, I think. Okay, we have like five minutes. Hmm. Okay. I think what we'll do... I think we'll... We'll look at three verses... I'll ask you a question, and then I think we'll finish up the rest next week. Okay, in chapter 16, (laughs) I told you it was long that we summarized. 16, verse 20. And remember, Ahithophel, that is the advisor of David who abandoned him. Then said Absalom, David's son, to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto your father's concubines, which he has left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So Absalom, the usurping son, has taken Jerusalem now that David fled. He talks to this advisor that conspired with him. Hey, what do we do now? We're on the throne. What's the next move? And he says, oh, well, you need to sleep with your father's concubines. Now, ancient Near Eastern culture, if you, especially with kingly authority, if this new Absalom is now, has and is sleeping with the concubines of the previous king, Well, like, you're pretty much asserting your full dominance over the house and everything that that means. Again, that was part of the judgment that God had placed before. He said, hey, you did your sin in secret. This is going to come out in public. So that's, for political reasons, they set this up on the roof of the palace, and 
it's, it's odd, it's weird, it's dark. But I like question 15. Compare David's immoral sin with Absalom's immoral sin. I know we read more of the biblical text about David. But we have two men who acted sinfully tonight. How do you feel about each in comparison? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? How do we how do we compare these two? Yeah. By the way, he, he Uriah died. And he, oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, all right, all right. Go ahead. I wonder if David had taken care of the other side, like he should have. Maybe the situation with Absalom wouldn't have happened. Maybe mm-hmm. it would have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, how I... So I, I take more into account than just the murders. Because then you also... and. It, Again, we read the summary. I don't think it impacts quite as much when we read from the book that... So not after this, Absalom, for several years, conspires to steal the throne. Absalom's a thinker, if nothing else. He thinks things out. Uh, He's patient, yes. Um, He conspires to steal the throne. He steals the throne. And then intentionally makes himself... it, It says, you'll make yourself abhorrent to your father. So... You sleep with the concubines, not only is that the political power move, they're like, okay, now everyone knows you and your father are on the outs. Like, it's one or the other, and you have the popular support. They're going to follow you. 
There seems to be a lot of spite in what Absalom's doing. So to me, I kind of see David as he made this very short series of very bad sins and then repented of it and kept going on with his life, whereas Absalom's is spiteful and long and drawn out. Well, and that's the question. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that that's not explicitly said that, like, it's not explicitly said that he's blaming David for not taking care of the problem. But yeah, when you put these pieces together, he's, in, I think in his mind, he's doing what David stopped doing. He, he's, I almost wonder if it's supposed to play out as a twisted inversion of like, again, how David, when David was fleeing from Saul, he was being the king to the people that Saul wasn't. And again, in a darker, messed up way, when David stops acting like the king, someone takes over for him, but it's not the way you want it to be. Yeah. Right, back in the day, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that's where we'll leave it. We're leaving it in a cliffhanger. David is once again on the run. Absalom is in Jerusalem, reigning as the usurping king. And yeah, we saw an unfortunate side of David tonight. And it's very purposefully split up as we saw chapters and chapters of David just being everything the man of God should be last week. And now we're seeing how he fails to live up to that this week. So yeah, we'll finish that up next week. And based on what we're supposed to cover, we should be able to get back onto our schedule. So um, any, any thoughts, questions we need to address before we go? All good with this? Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word and for this time of study, even, even when your word is difficult, whether it's, no matter what it is, when, it, when it's difficult for a host of reasons that we encountered tonight, I just thank you that we can still, still learn from it, still learn from your character, and we can learn from even the failure of some of your servants and how your heart is, what your, your plans are, your, your mission, and I just pray that we would be able to take what we learned tonight and just add it to the host of things we know about who you are and how you are, and just pray that you would bring something fruitful from this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, thank you.